Good afternoon. I'm Gary Jordan of NASA Public Affairs, and thank you for joining us here at NASA Johnson Space Center for the Expedition 4748 Crew News Conference. I'm here with the crew, who is set to launch on March 18th, U.S. time, March 19th, Kazakhstan time, from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Veteran NASA astronaut Jeff Williams and two Ros Roscosmos cosmonauts, Alexei Ovchinin and commander of the Soyuz TMA-20M spacecraft and flight engineer Oleg Skripochka. Guys, thanks for being here today. A little bit about our crew before we move on. Um, Jeff has a total of 362 cumulative days in space, one on space shuttle flight STS-101 on Atlantis, and two flights on the Soyuz spacecraft to the International Space Station for Expedition 13 and 2122. He will take over as commander for Expedition 48. For Lexi, this will be his first space flight. He was an instructor pilot and an air flight commander before becoming a cosmonaut in 2006, finished his basic training in 2009. We're excited to see your flight. Oleg has one space flight on Expedition 2526, accumulating 159 days in space during his five-month stay on the International Space Station. So why don't we start with you, Jeff, and then we'll move on to the rest of the crew. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, your training over these past couple months. Well, we've uh, been training actually for the last couple of years, as, as you know, preparing for this. The last couple of months have been focused on the uh, mission specifics. Prior to that was the generic training, whether it be refresher training or the first time going through it. Uh, so the last couple of months have been focused on the actual specifics of the mission content. Uh, these guys were in Germany in December. I was in Japan uh, for final training there in those respective places, and now we're here in Houston. Uh, for two weeks uh, uh, as a Soyuz crew, uh, getting our final uh, systems updates as well as some uh, payload and, and experiment training, as well as taking some medical data that, to support uh, some of the experiments that they'll, they will be doing on us. Uh, and then uh, the, um, the ever-present uh, preparation for emergencies. Emergency training is one of the big things that we do when we're together as a crew. Uh, after the two-week period here in Houston, uh, uh, Alexei and Oleg will return to Russia. Uh, I will join them a couple weeks later, and then we'll get into our final training in Star City, just outside of Moscow, uh, go through our final exams there, um, get uh, signed off by the Russian Commission that we're ready for flight, and then we'll, of course, take our, our trip down to Baikonur and do the final preparations and leading up to the launch date. Um, uh, on the 18th, uh, Houston time, as you said. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, we've had uh, a great experience training together. Uh, Alexei and I were uh, previously on a backup crew uh, for the one-year flight uh, a year ago. Uh, Oleg was on the backup crew for this uh, past September launch. Um, and then when he completed that, uh, we joined together as a crew preparing for this March launch. So it's, a, it's a, been a very good experience for us, and we're looking forward to fly in uh, together here uh, for a six-month stay on the space station. With that, I'd like to give uh, Alexei a chance to, uh, to give his perspective on uh, anticipation of a first flight. Uh, before he does that, I, I will say that one of the things I'm looking forward to the most is, uh, is watching him go through the experience of, of uh, first launch and, and uh, first time in weightlessness and, and then the first flight in space station. That's always one of the more enjoyable things uh, to do if you've been there and done it before. Это будет мой первый полет, как уже сказали. Я к нему готовлюсь уже более 9 лет. Очень хочу слетать. Очень бы хотелось, чтобы это был первый и не последний полет. Надеюсь, что все мои ожидания оправдаются, что мне очень понравится. Как Джефф уже сказал, мы вместе тренируемся уже два года. В России мы изучаем системы российского сегмента. Здесь, в Америке, изучаем системы, работу с ними по американскому сегменту. Также ездили в Германию, где проходили обучение по европейскому сегменту Международной космической станции, ну, и в Японии по японскому сегменту. Я считаю, что наш экипаж достаточно подготовлен, что мы справимся со всеми поставленными задачами. 
Well, this will be my first flight, and I have been getting ready for nine years, and I'm really looking forward to this flight, and I'm hoping it will be my first, but not last flight. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, all my hopes will be fulfilled, and I will fulfill everybody's expectations. We have been training for two years, training on the Russian segment systems in Russia and on the U.S. segment systems in the United States. And also we have been getting ready to work uh, on the European part of the station, and we, will, we have been uh, training in Germany for that. And in Japan we have been training to be ready to work on the Japanese hardware. So the crew is completely ready. Excellent. Now, Oleg, you had your space flight in 2010. Um, how will you take that experience to uh, this upcoming flight? So as Jeff said, yeah, this is my second flight. It should be my second flight. Mm -hmm. And in comparison with first flight, I see that there are some many more numbers of scientific experiments that we, that we should <coughs> do on board from Russian side and from American side, and there are some experiments that the whole crew involved in. So I think it's a good sign for us. We will work as one team. We will not spend our time for nothing. Excellent. We're excited to see your flight. And Jeff, I know that you mentioned that you'll be focusing on history um, for your communication on the International Space Station. We actually have some special guests with us today from the Houston History Alliance. Um, we also have some special guests from the Emerge Employee Resource Group. Uh, they are the young professionals here, and also we have some interns and, of course, our media guests. Uh, so with that, we're going to start opening it up for questions. Uh, just a reminder that if you call into the phone bridge to please press star 1 to ask a question, and star 2 to withdraw that question if it has been answered. And if you're following along on social media, we're using the hashtag AskNASA. So why don't we start with some of the media that we have in the audience. Um, if you'd like to start, please state your name and affiliation. Uh, I'm Mark for uh, Aviation Week and Space Technology. And uh, I'll start with Jeff, if that's all right. Um, there's so much interest in, in furthering uh, the development of the station for a commercial crew. Um, I know it's a little bit fluid, um, but can you kind of describe what, what you're prepared to do in terms of furthering work on the outside and maybe inside to uh, get the first and maybe further than that, first docking module and maybe more applied during your time? Of course, the primary task that we have in the plan right now and the, the date is a little bit fluid, I think, uh, but it will be the arrival of the first uh, docking adapter for commercial crew, which uh, we will install on the front end of the space station on PMA-1. Um, and that will involve one EVA to integrate it, uh, to install it, and then integrate it and, uh, so that we can do the checkout of it to prepare then for uh, the uh, first launch of a commercial crew vehicle, which of course will happen after our expedition. But that's the major event that uh, we have on our plate during our stay. They're currently in the plan to support commercial crew. Of course, that's a... Uh, um, a significant milestone as we all anticipate uh, the uh, the first flight and subsequent flights of commercial crew vehicles uh, according to the current plan from the two companies uh, which will significantly expand the capability that we have to uh, for access to low earth orbit and specifically the space station um, it uh, sometimes it, uh, we we tend to um, here that uh, the, the impression out there is that we're dependent on the Russian side for access and certainly there's some truth in that but uh, I like to put it in a little bit different way in that the Russian side has been great partners with us on the ISS program um, and we chose to retire the shuttle and there was rationale to do that and it's taken some time to develop the next generation of vehicles to get there so that has resulted in a gap uh, but the Soyuz, uh, as, in terms of the space station program, has been in the program since the beginning. Uh, and uh, so it, the Russians have, um, have, as I said, been very good partners in that to step up to the plate to, to fill the gap that we didn't anticipate in the beginning. 
Also, I would say that when we do begin flying commercial crew vehicles, that it's not going to be now where the U.S. side is doing one thing and the Russian side is doing another. Uh, it, they, the two vehicles, uh, or two types of vehicles, maybe three vehicles, will complement one another to sustain the, the ISS program out to the end of its uh, life. Um, and uh, I think it's probably fair to say to assume that there will continue to be one U.S. crew member on every Soyuz and one Russian cosmonaut on every U.S. commercial vehicle after that. And it, it, from an operational point of view, we need to do that uh, for the case when we, uh, as a contingency, we need to go down to one uh, crewed, uh, one vehicle crew on board space station, in other words, three or four people. Uh, we have to have the expertise required for the systems on both sides of the, both ends of the space station. Good question. Any more from the media? Yes, sir. Um, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Um, I, uh, for Jeff, I, I, I understand <coughs> that um, while you're on board, the beam uh, inflatable module will be, will be expanded. Can you describe <coughs> the process from the crew side of what you will do to monitor that process as well as entering it and how often you'll have access to that um, to that module. Yeah, we're uh, very excited anticipating the, the beam coming up on SpaceX um, and deploying it as an experiment. That's one of the major categories uh, of utilization of the space station is the development of new technologies and uh, in a sense opening up the door to, to uh, um, commercial uh, ventures in space and beam represents both of those aspects. So it'll come up on SpaceX. Uh, it'll be uh, removed from the SpaceX vehicle and uh, berthed to the uh, Tranquility, the Node 3 aft berthing port. Uh, and it will sit there for a time. That, that operation obviously will occur with, when SpaceX is berthed to the space station. The actual deployment of, of BEAM, I think, according to the current plan, will be after that SpaceX vehicle departs uh, and returns to Earth. Um, but BEAM is a technology demonstration which uh, 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 does just what you alluded to. It's an inflatable module, so its volume is smaller than when it launches um, than when it's utilized in space. So it, it takes less room, and, and that technology has some great promise for, for the launching of future spacecraft um, on rockets with smaller volume and then expanding it to a full volume to be able to utilize uh, those volumes in different ways uh, uh, on future spacecraft. So basically after uh, SpaceX leaves and we get uh, to the, the time and the plan where we're gonna deploy beam, it will be deployed with an internal mechanical structure um, out to its full volume. Uh, there will be vacuum on the inside, there's vacuum on the outside so that deployment physically can occur. And then after that, it will be pressurized with air tanks that are inherent internal to the beam module itself. Uh, after it's pressurized, we will equalize the pressure between the station and beam, ingress, install some sensors uh, for the data collection for the time that it's there. Um, and then uh, the, the nominal configuration, though, will be hatches closed, although there will be air transfer uh, ventilation between beam and the space station. The hatches will nominally be closed, and then it will sit there for its uh, period of time. The data will be collection, uh, collected, and uh, uh, it will see how the performance of that new technology turns out to be. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, Ed Mayberry with KUHF Radio here in Houston. Uh, I wanted to ask each of you what your specific jobs will be in this mission. And with the uh, docking apparatus being part of the mission, Will any of you be doing spacewalks? Uh, I will say that each of us are trained in many aspects of uh, space station operations. Um, so there will be a common set of things that we're all doing um, based on how we're scheduled for day to day. So the, the operation of the space station, some of the maintenance of the space station, some of the execution of routine activities will all be responsible for that. Um, of course, we have some specialty areas. Um, I um, will be responsible for, example, all of the systems on the U.S. segment, uh, whereas uh, Alexei and Oleg will have greater responsibility on the Russian segment because that's where we have specialized in those areas. We, um, uh, uh, 
so that's a, a general answer. Um, as was as Gary mentioned in the beginning, I will take over command for Expedition 48 from Tim Copra. And for 47, of course, we'll be augmenting uh, Tim Copra, Tim Peake, and Yuri um, uh, Malenchiko, uh, who are currently on board. Uh, Tim Copra will be the commander, so that'll be his responsibility, and then he'll hand it over to me for Expedition 48. In terms of the docking adapter, it depends upon when that comes, whether it, it arrives uh, during Expedition 47 or 48. There will be, as I said, one spacewalk associated with the, the integration of that docking adapter, uh, and it will be a combination of a couple of us in the U.S. segment. It hasn't been determined uh, who will be on that spacewalk, but it will be, if it's in 47, it'll be um, two of the three of us, Tim Culper, Tim Peake, or myself. Um, if it's during 48, it will be two of the three of, of uh, Kate, Rubens, uh, Takuya, uh, from uh, JAXA and uh, or, or myself, so that that's yet to be determined. So, yes, sir. Uh, uh, two weeks before uh, the end of your scheduled expedition, you're supposed to, or you're expected to pass uh, Scott Kelly's 520-day commitment time uh, on the airport most experienced astronaut. Um, does this represent change or relaxation of NASA policy regarding uh, commutative? exposure to radiation for long duration mission? No, it doesn't represent a change at all. Uh, we have standards that have been applied and I haven't followed the history of those things, but I, they haven't been changed for this. They were looked at a little bit closer for the one year flight. And as you, you know, I backed up Scott and he and I met the requirements uh, for, to be able to execute the one year mission without exceeding our lifetime limits. Um, and of course, so now with the six month flight for myself um, and accumulating the days that it will, I still do not exceed the lifetime issue. So no changes at all. Excellent. Uh, Megan, do we have any questions on social media? Yes. We have a question from Peter Robinson on the International Space Station Facebook page. Will you be taking some of your own personal belongings to the station, and what will you be doing on your off-duty days for any of you? Oh, I'll like you to start. Mm, every astronaut can take his own things with him, but uh, the amount is strongly limited. As far as I know, it's about one kilo per person I can take on board. Usually, it's some uh, family photos or some pictures, some souvenirs, maybe. It's some stuff like this. Alexei, any items that you're going to be bringing? Да, я тоже, как и Олег, возьму фотографии родных, близких, также со мной. На борту будет э, игрушка, которую на время полета мне даст моя дочь с собой. Эта игрушка изначально будет индикатором невесомости, вот, а потом она со мной будет полгода, будет напоминать о родных и близких. После полета я ее верну дочке. Yes, just like Oleg, I'm going to take photographs of my relatives and loved ones. Plus, I will take a toy taken from my daughter, and it will serve at first as an indicator of zero G, and later it will serve as a reminder of my daughter, and when I come home, I will return it to her. Amazing. Megan, any more social media questions? Yes. We have one on Twitter from Laura Austin. Who would you credit on having the greatest influence on you being what you're doing and where you're doing it? Well, uh, let's see, there's a short list for me. Certainly my father inspired me growing up. Uh, he was a school teacher, he taught history. Later when I went through high school, he was a guidance counselor. He opened me up to, uh, to the world of uh, military opportunities and, and the academies specifically, and I ended up going to, to the military academy at West Point. Uh, so that, uh, uh, I would certainly include him on that list. I had a sixth grade science teacher uh, which significantly, uh, who significantly influenced me uh, during uh, those years, sixth and seventh grade, uh, to inspire me in science. So I would, I would 
uh, also include him, and there's several others as well. Alexei, any any idols or any inspirations? Меня вдохновил вдохновили стать космонавтом, наверное, российские космонавты. Еще будучи ребенком, смотря телевизор, видя газеты, каждый старт экипажа или посадка освещалась очень ярко. Это была новость номер один. И видя этих людей, мне стало интересно, и я решил, что я стану космонавтом. Я это решил в возрасте, наверное, семь-восемь лет. Well, what um, prompted me to become a cosmonaut, I think it was uh, other Russian cosmonauts, uh, because uh, during every launch and landing, there was a uh, wide coverage on Russian TV and newspapers, and it was presented in such a way that uh, I really wanted to become a cosmonaut. And I made my decision when I was about seven or eight years old. Very cool. Well, Jeff, with your father being a history teacher, I think we'll turn it over to the Houston History Alliance. I'm sure you guys have some great questions. Who's first? This man in the back. I have a question. I'm Debbie Harwell. I'm on the board for the Houston History Alliance, and I'm the managing editor of Houston History Magazine. In uh, 2008, we did an, an issue with NASA on the history of the first 20 years of the space program. and. Uh, Chris Kraft said at that time that he thought that Apollo 8 was the most significant mission that uh, NASA had done. And I was just curious to know what you think was the most significant mission and why. Well, I suppose it would depend upon how you, you, you approach that question and how you define the significance. Obviously, I think the, uh, that was a significant mission. I mean, they, they they added objectives to that mission that were not envisioned uh, initially. They, they, what was envisioned initially to be accomplished over, I think, several missions, as I recall, they put together in one mission. That was actually going to the moon and orbiting the moon and, and all of that, as you know better than I do, probably. Um, the, the most significant mission, I think, in, from a world's perspective point of view, from the historic perspective, would be Apollo 11. Uh, that's when the whole world was watching. Um, ironically, shortly after that, uh, much of the world stopped paying attention. Um, and we know that as well, too. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's a lesson in history in itself. There were some motivations, I think, that, uh, that focused the world on Apollo 11, the moon landing, and those motivations went away afterwards. Um, so, I mean, I could go on and on about that, but I'll, I'll leave it at that so we can get to the next question. Any more from the... In the back, yes. Hi, Carolyn Saunders from the New York Natural Science. What's the toy you're taking for your for your daughter for your daughter? And will you be videotaping it so we can enjoy how it performs? <laughs> uh, игрушка уже определена давно. Uh, у меня дочке восемь с половиной лет. Она очень любит игрушки сову, игрушку в виде совы. У нас, наверное, целая коллекция uh, этих сов. Вот одна из них, не очень большая, будет со мной эти полгода. Uh, my daughter is eight and a half years old right now, and she is very fond of toys in the shape of owls. So we have a whole collection of owls, and I will be taking one of them. And Yana, who is her name, mm -hmm. is very enthusiastic about all of that. Every time I have been to their apartment, uh, she spends some time showing me all of her new uh, items. Yes, sir. Eddie, Eddie Weller from Sandstone College of Houston History Alliance. Um, I grew up and remember Apollo 11 as a kid, just couldn't wait, had pictures of astronauts on the wall, and that impacted me enormously. I'm curious, in your career at NASA, what do you think has been the greatest impact um, for the future generations, for those you see coming up? Uh, well, it has just worked out in my career that uh, in the, uh, the assignments that I've gotten that it's been focused on space station. Uh, and one of the reasons that I want to maybe delve into the historic aspect of it, and it would, I mean, it won't be a, a big focus on history. What I want to try to do is remind the world of the significance of the 
history of the space station, um, when it was first thought about, which goes way back, decades back, right? And then when it was uh, finally um, announced in 1984, Space Station Freedom, and then it, when it morphed in the early 90s from Space Station Freedom, which, by the way, was canceled prior to ISS, and, um, and then it became the International Space Station with a new partnership of Russia. Um, and then going through the technical challenges of, of developing the operations during phase one, uh, the shuttle Mir program, uh, and so that we would learn how to work uh, with each other's systems and, and get to know one another to prepare us for the ISS. And then building the ISS over many years with many challenges to include uh, the, uh, the consequences of the, the Columbia accident and the loss of that crew. Um, and uh, the partnership working together to do all of that and to uh, to assemble this the the to me the, the it, it, it's fair to argue that the the greatest achievement of the space station program is the space station itself um, and that's what I want to try to uh, in some way maybe enrich the awareness of the public not so much because of the history but because of what that history enables us to do in the future Way in the back, yes. Hi, my name is Amy Rogers. I'm with the 1920 Air Terminal Museum over at William P. Hubby Airport, uh, where our focus is on aviation and aerospace history. Um, a major part of our mission is to educate and inspire the next generation of aviators and, and aerospace professionals. So we have found that by having all of the history available in the museum um, hasn't always been enough. And so we've been finding ways to reach out to people like yourself to come out and speak to the children, and we found that that's been the most impactful. Um, would you agree that the best way to really inspire the next generation is have them hear the history, but from the mouth of the individuals that have actually lived it and are doing it now? Certainly, I agree that that is an uh, inspiring experience, and I think we can all relate to that when we grew up, each of us here in the room, when we grew up hearing uh, the accounts uh, from people that were involved in some endeavor, that was an inspiration. I bet everybody in here can, can uh, go back and remember the significance of that in our each individual life, so certainly. Uh, and we all try to do it, I know, in Russia. Uh, the cosmonauts also uh, speak often to uh, to uh, children or to young people, universities or whatnot. Uh, Oleg uh, went to Bauman University in Moscow. I have spoken there with a, a group of astronauts and cosmonauts in the past, so certainly that's an important thing to do. Unfortunately, it's it's uh, very difficult to touch all those people we'd like to touch in that personal way. I know you guys have a million questions, but uh, why don't we move on to uh, our Emerge group and the interns. Any questions from this side? I have a question. Um, my name is Isha Patel, and thank you so much for being here. Um, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of your crew time is dedicated to visualization. Um, are there any science projects you guys are most looking forward to? Alexei, why don't you talk about uh, fluid shifts? <laughs> Not that you're looking forward to it, but it is an interesting <laughs> experiment. Ну, во-первых, первое, что я жду, это своего первого космического полета. Это, наверное, самая главная вещь, которую я жду в ближайшее время. Uh, well, the first thing that I am really anticipating is my first space flight. Во время нашего космического полета мы будем выполнять различные эксперименты. Один из экспериментов, который мы будем выполнять вместе с Джеффом, это будет эксперимент Fluid Shift. And during our flight, we are going to be performing several experiments. And one of them I'm going to be performing with Jeff, and uh, this is fluid shifts experiment. Это эксперимент, который направлен на изучение организма человека. Значит, этот эксперимент проводится совместно российской, американской стороной. And this is an experiment uh, that is. Uh, directed to study the human body, and both the U.S. and Russian sides are taking part in it. Этот эксперимент начался недавно, 
И сейчас главная задача – это сбор статистического материала. And this experiment was just recently started, and its main purpose is to gather data. Я надеюсь, что результаты этого эксперимента в будущем позволят ученым, врачам сделать выводы, которые позволят путешествовать космонавтам, астронавтам в длительных космических полетах к дальним планетам, на астероиды и возвращаться оттуда в хорошей физической форме. And, um... It is to be hoped that the results of this experiment will allow the medical specialists to draw conclusions that will be beneficial for application to long-term space flights to distant planets and asteroids, and they will allow astronauts to return to Earth without any physical or other impacts to their body. Основная цель этого эксперимента – это исследование влияния факторов космического полета на организм человека. So the main thrust of this experiment is to study the impact of space flight on human body. Excellent. So, uh, any more questions from the media that we have here? Yes, sir. Uh, Mark uh, from Aviation Week in Space Technology, and this is uh, for the cosmos. Will there be any prep work for the multi-purpose laboratory module that, uh, as far as I know, is still to go to the space station at some point for the Russian part? Такой конкретной подготовки нет, но я очень надеюсь, что она скоро начнется, потому что в ближайший год-два планируется запуск этого модуля к Международной космической станции. So far there is no specific preparation for the MPLM, but I'm really hoping that in a year or two we will have the preparation started because we are expecting this module on the station. Very good. Any more? Yes, sir. Hi, Ed with KUHF again. Uh, Jeff, you talked about looking forward to seeing a crew member make the first launch, you know, go through that experience. You've been through four. Can you talk a little about, you know, compare the first, second, and third launch, fourth launch that you've been through? Well, the first launch, of course, was on the space shuttle for me, and uh, it was uh, uh, everything I had hoped for and more, and I still remember it as if it was yesterday. Um, uh, I was the only rookie on that crew, so everybody else had uh, given me lots of advice and tips, and they were available for, to answer my questions as we trained for that for a better part of a couple years. Um, and it was just a great experience. It, it, but it was 10 days long in, in the flight, so it, uh, it was one of those cases where you landed and then you turned around and you say, what just happened to me, because it went so fast. Uh, the second uh, launch was uh, my first one on a Soyuz. So it was a different vehicle, completely different environment. Uh, Toko Paderewski uh, was only in Russian language, so it was uh, had that uh, uh, very historic operation in Kazakhstan. Um, very unique, uh, and even to this day, I'm still overwhelmed with the irony of having of doing what we're doing, and have it done then. Growing up in my early career as a, a U.S. Army officer in the fold of gap. You know, in the height of the Cold War, uh, and now you know we've been working as partners and working well as partners for many years. Um, so the Soyuz was a different vehicle, uh, but it was it was it's a rocket, and both of them are rockets. But instead of seven people and thirty or forty thousand pounds of payload, we're three people and a few hundred pounds of payload, and I I characterize it as triplets in a womb. Um, in the Soyuz, um, so it was uh, it was a very good experience as well. Uh, the last uh, uh, flight was, of course, a repeat of that. And when you repeat something, you have the advantage to actually you're not surprised by things, so you're able to observe and take in more details of the experience. And I, I think that that was my experience with the last Soyuz flight. 
Um, and uh, on that crew, I was, even though I was the American, I was the experienced Soyuz crew member. Um, so th there were some rewards uh, along with that to, to help the other guys uh, get through the experience. And so I look forward to this coming one along those lines of, of uh, having done it before, being able to, to observe and take in a few more details to be able to characterize the experience in a fuller way. Yes, sir. Flexbase.com again uh, for Oleg. Um, you're flying on the last TMAM class uh, Soyuz, but you, your, you and your crew were, I think, originally um, scheduled for uh, the first MS uh, vehicle. I wonder if you could tell, uh, share what some of the differences between this uh, retiring class of Soyuz and what the next one brings, and how that changed in your training. Разница в том, ну, так получилось, что мой первый полет был на первом корабле серии ТМА-М. И разница с предыдущей версией была существенная, потому что поскольку стоил более мощный компьютер, и система управления, она полностью меняла идеологию работы экипажа в корабле. Uh, yes, there is a difference, and my first flight was on Soyuz TMA-M. And the main difference is in a more powerful computer, which completely changes the crew actions. Отличие Союза МС от Союза ТМА-М в том, что там меняются оконечные истории. То есть начинает использоваться спутниковая навигация и более совершенные системы сближения. So the difference uh, between Soyuz MS and Soyuz TMA M is uh, in the satellite navigation system and the prox option. Okay, well, uh, one more from the vehicle. And also the thrusters, uh, there are changes in the thrusters on the Soyuz. Yes, sir. Uh, related to Robert's question about Soyuz MS as well, would, uh, would you be able to expand on uh, some of the delays that caused, some of the reasons for the delay of the launch of Soyuz MS? Насколько я знаю, проблема, скажем, сертификация совместной работы нового корабля и ракетоносителя. То есть это больше формальная работа, которая сейчас проводится. Well, as far as I understand, the delay was due to paperwork to certify the integration of the launch vehicle and the Soyuz vehicle. And of course, that was a result of the, the progress rocket failure last April. Да, это да, и также по требованиям безопасности необходимо, чтобы два прогресса, новые модификации стартовали и пристыковали станции успешно перед полетом первого пилотируемого Союза МС. Yes, and also there is a requirement that there are two successful progress launches and dockings, the progresses with a new modification, and after that you can have a flight of Союз МС. Изначально старт первого Союза МС пилотируемого планировался на март месяц. Наш экипаж планировался в полет на новом корабле, но в связи с некоторыми передвижками, изменениями, сейчас пока старт первого пилотируемого Союза МС переносится на конец мая, начало июня. And initially, our crew was planned to launch on the new Soyuz in March, but um, now the Soyuz MS launch was um, delayed up to the end of May or to start of June. So that's when we will have the first piloted uh, Soyuz vehicle, Soyuz MS launch. The good news for these guys, especially, is uh, you asked about training. Uh, moving off the MS back in the TMAM reduced the training for them, so they were able to have a little vacation before coming to Houston this time. <laughs> 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 
In the meantime, uh, Megan, any social media questions? Yep, we have one from Karen on Twitter. Which space station feature or piece of equipment are you most looking forward to using? <laughs> well, there's a lot of good equipment on the space station. Uh, I'll speak personally from a personal point of view. Uh, one of my hobbies up there in the little free time that we are able to squeeze in is taking pictures of the Earth. And we have new photography equipment up there since I left last. So I look forward to, uh, to using that new still photography and video equipment. Alexei and Oleg? Я думаю, что, наверное, нет такого оборудования. Возможно, во время полета появится. Я тогда дам знать позже. So far, I don't have such a piece of hardware that I'm really looking forward to use. But as soon as I know, I will let you know. And as Jeff said, the most interesting pastime on the station is Earth observing for every crew member. So. Uh, as far as I know, there are some new, like, new objectives, более мощные для фотоаппарата. Можно будет делать более совершенные фотоснимки. Well, as I know that uh, new lenses have been delivered for cameras, and I'm looking forward to this experience of taking pictures with the new lenses. And some of the astronaut photography is some of the some of the most beautiful things we see from the from the International Space Station, for sure. Any more, uh, any more social media questions? From Michael on Twitter, how do you listen to music on the space station? Do you plan to bring your own music? We each have the opportunity to select music pre-flight and put it on a, um, a device where we, you know, portable device on board. So that'll fly up with us on Soyuz. Uh, so we'll have it on board. And we also have opportunity, you know, if we have requests while we're up there to get uh, uh, other music, and as well as other entertainment uplinked to us. So we're well supported in along those lines. Также на борту находится специальный сервер, с которым в котором тоже загружено очень много фильмов, музыки, очень много различной музыки. Можно слушать любые стили, направления, кому что нравится. Also, we have a special server on board, which is loaded with movies and uh, different kinds of music. So we can choose whatever we want. OK, let's pass it on to the uh, Houston History Alliance. I'm sure you guys have more questions. Yes, ma'am. I'm Cecilia on mother of the Houston History Alliance. So a uh, generation before all of you, the, the space people involved with the space program was, it was uh, with your respective space programs, were really focused on competition. And within your careers, you've seen it transition from competition to collaboration. I'd like to hear about what that transition has been like when you your career. <coughs> Uh, in terms of the partnership, as a, you're going all the way back to the space race of the 60s, right? Yeah, the, obviously that was driven by the geopolitics at the time uh, and the circumstances that had been set up with the, the, uh, in the Cold War and all that. And that's uh, uh, that chapter of history. Um, actually, you can go all the way back to the mid-70s and, and even during the Apollo Moon missions was envisioned, had been proposed a joint mission with the, at the time, Soviet Union with Apollo Soyuz, and that was very successful. Uh, and it was very significant also uh, from a world's point of view. In fact, uh, I was in Moscow in July for the 40th anniversary of Apollo Soyuz, or as it's referred to over there, Soyuz Apollo. Um, <laughs> uh, and it was, it was big news in Russia. In fact, uh, I like to tell the story when I was departing Russia in July, going through the Russian customs uh, passport control. Uh, on our official passport, we have a little NASA sticker. And uh, the passport agent uh, in Russia asked me, so were you here for Soyuz Apollo anniversary? So it was in the news. Everybody was aware of it. So uh, that gives you an idea of the perspective of the public, uh, particularly in Russia. 
and we get the same kind of support in our experience in the International Space Station. So obviously we all think, and you've heard this from crew members before, we hope that uh, the, the International Space Station can serve as an example to the world to temper uh, some of the other uh, geopolitical um, stresses and conflicts and, and whatnot that go on at, in different degrees in history and, and help uh, set an example to the world to, uh, to cooperate as opposed to um, causing conflict. Well, you brought up a little bit of that when we were discussing, you know, talking about transition within your career, starting at West Point and being an Army officer and then going on to the space program. I mean, that must have been, for you, a really interesting cultural change for you. Of course, it was very interesting, and like I said earlier, I'm still overwhelmed with the irony of history of uh, of personally being able to experience that. And uh, I will always say it's much better this way than the previous way, right? We'd rather be uh, um, be making efforts together in a constructive way rather than efforts against one another that's potentially uh, not constructive. Excellent. And it sounds like uh, we have some callers in on the phone bridge. Uh, Michael Casey from foxnews.com, you're on. Might have been disconnected. Do we have another caller on the phone bridge? Okay. Um, Houston History Alliance. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the International Space Station represents international cooperation. Do you see this cooperation continuing and maybe even some of the components of the space station design continuing with Russia and the U.S. going say, to the moon or to Mars or to uh, an asteroid? Certainly, I think it's highly probable that future programs will be, will use the, the experience and the example of the International Space Station to build on. There, and there's several reasons for that. Obviously, there's a technology that developed for the space station and now in the uh, utilization of the space station proven out to support future exploration. Um, and there's continuous dialogue going on among the partnership. And there's dialogue even beyond the partnership with other nations uh, you know, to look at the potential possible partnership and future endeavors. If you go back and look at it history again and you look at the moon race, that, those were single nations, uh, right? And as soon as Apollo 11 happened, as I alluded to earlier, the, the support kind of diminished rapidly. Um, so there was the geopolitical circumstances driving that. The, the, this largely symbolic victory was won. And uh, so the, the technical objectives uh, weren't there. Um, to sustain, well, I'll, I'll back up a little bit and I'll give you a personal viewpoint based on my experience of working through the space station. Uh, I believe if we were not partners with Russia specifically in the International Space Station, neither of our countries would be flying people in space today. That's my personal belief. Um, and if you, if you examine the history, you, it's very logical to come to that conclusion. That being said, it's very likely that future endeavors, especially big endeavors, uh, whether it be going back to the moon or cis lunar, as we like to call it, you know, in the in the lunar system of different potential mission profiles, and of course Mars is always out there, right? We're always talking about Mars or, or even other destinations. Um, if you look at the scope of doing that, and you look at the history as I described, I can't imagine ever doing that to completion outside of an international partnership. Excellent. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm part of the Young Professionals Resource Group here on site. Um, and a couple of our friends and members of our uh, employee resource group are applying to be astronauts. And I was wondering if you had any tips for them as they apply and then go through the interview process. Keep working hard at what you're doing. And um, uh, keep persevering with that goal. Keep doing the best job you can at what you're doing. Um, continue to seek uh, education opportunities as you get them. Um, and then keep applying and persevere. Don't get distracted with the application process. Don't get dis disappointed if you fail to get selected once or twice or, in my case, multiple times over 10 years. Uh, just 
keep keep working at it. And uh, when, if and when the door opens, you won't know why it opened anyway, because none of us do. None of us know why we got the opportunity, I'm, but I'm very grateful for it. Uh, so keep doing what you're doing. Yes, sir. A question for Owen. With the Soyuz, it's a, it's a workhorse vehicle of human space flight, but because it is so automated now, what's the best part about flying it? What, what are you going to have the most fun at doing? And that's really a question for the kids that are watching this or on Facebook. So what's the best part about flying it? Where are you going to have the most fun? Most fun? <coughs> Mm, I can say my impression from my first flight. The most fun when we launched, I felt about 20 billion horses behind my back <laughs> for 10 <laughs> minutes, yeah. <laughs> and when, when <clears throat> launch vehicle stopped working, we were put it on orbit, and I felt real zero G, and I completely understood that this is conditions I will spend next half a year. So it was very uncommon for me when I first time look at the window and I saw round Earth, black sky and stars above them. I understood I really in the space. This is, was really exciting for me. But it was very short period because uh, crew has a lot of things to do after just launching. But the first impression was the strongest. I would like to ask Oleg uh, to complete that question, just to, since you asked uh, fun on Soyuz, to describe your landing six months later. <laughs> 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 this was the final ex exciting part of us because we landed March 16, was real uh, strong wind, real, real winter conditions. So yeah. Yeah, we, we landed on the, on, the, on the ground, and then we, are, we were followed by parachute for 100 meters about. So, and we are attending a side council. Yeah. I didn't feel well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I just meant I didn't feel well when I uh, was in gravity after being in zero-g conditions after a long, long period when we was just going down in air. But after landing, we are rotated for 100 meters just to complete this feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. That, that we call soft landing. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Alex Rubin, biomedical flight controller. Uh, I have a question for Jeff, actually. With the recent federal budget passing and NASA receiving more money than they actually requested, do you think that this indicates a new interest in science and technology? And how do you think it will affect NASA operations going forward? I don't know exactly what it indicates. Um, however, I think it's great news, especially as I recall, and I haven't read a lot of details on it, but uh, as, I, as far as I know, it had to do with the development of uh, future capability, right, beyond the space station and maybe um, uh, investing in uh, the systems that are required to support human life in space. And whether that be uh, proven out on the space station or it be developed for the launch in a different uh, spacecraft, uh, that's good news. We that, That's one of the primary uh, achievements, I think, of the space station program is actually developing the technology, launching it, operating it, having it break, having it not work the way it designed, and then uh, responding to it and adjusting things and improving it, and then learning from maybe design flaws to redesign things. So that uh, element of the of the just released budget is is a very good news from that perspective. We have time for about one more. Yes, sir. Ethan O'Donnell, Houston History Magazine. Uh, I'm also a, a Chinese studies major at the University of Houston, and I wanted to ask you, Jeff, um, uh, regarding something like the Chinese exclusion policy, how have such policies helped or hindered the nation's space exploration efforts? I don't know if I can answer that question. Um, I know that there's been some dialogue going on, uh, at least from a uh, uh, technology viewpoint or programmatic viewpoint. I certainly, as I said before, future programs are very likely to be in an international context. 
what that means in direct regard to China, I'm not, I'm not sure. I can't really speak to. Okay. Well, I think that's about all the time that we have. Uh, we got some great questions today, so I'd like to thank everybody for their questions here in the room and on social media. Uh, I'd like to thank our guests for joining us today, the Houston History Alliance, the Emerge Group, our interns, and of course our media. And finally, thanks to the Expedition 4748 crew, uh, Jeff Williams, Alexei Ovchinin, and uh, Oleg Skripochka, guys. Thanks for being with us. Uh, with that, if the crew did not get to answer your question on social media, don't worry. We'll still be taking questions throughout the rest of the day. That's still the hashtag AskNASA. In the meantime, you can follow updates on social media. You can go to our International Space Station web pages on F Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also follow Jeff. Uh, his handle is AstroJeff on Twitter. And you can go to our website, www.nasa.gov station. So we're looking forward to the cruise launch on March 18th, US time, March 19th, Kazakhstan time. Good luck, guys, and thank you. Thank you, Gary.